Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistanomy. My name is Uzair Yunus and today we're going to be veering a bit off of the economy and talking a bit about Pakistan's nuclear program and nuclear security and safety, uh, motivated in part by a comment President Joe Biden made at a fundraiser in Los Angeles uh, where he was talking about global threats. Um, and in that line of conversation, he mentioned Pakistan, which he called maybe, uh, quote, maybe uh, one of the most dangerous countries in the world, nuclear weapons without any cohesion. Um, that obviously set off a firestorm for about 24 hours in Pakistan, leading to press conferences, uh, strong language or strongly worded demarches, um, a conversation about what this comment by the U.S. president means and why did he say this now, et cetera, et cetera. And so I figured I'm not a nuclear expert. I don't follow these things uh, that closely. Um, um, but, you know, if you study South Asia um, at any university, whether in the United States or elsewhere, um, odds are you will read a bit about the nuclear sort of competition in the region and, and Pakistan's uh, proliferation history and things like that. So today we're going to talk to an expert about this topic on this topic. I have the honor of hosting Dr. Christopher Clary. He's an assistant professor of political science at the University of Albany. Um, his research focuses on cooperation and interstate rivalries, the causes and consequences of nuclear proliferation and U.S. defense policy and the politics of South Asia. Um, Dr. Clary, in fact, um, uh, first of all, welcome to Pakistanomy and thank you for taking out the time on such short notice. Thanks for having me. I've uh, been a fan of the show for a while. Thank you. And and I remember reading your academic work and your writings and your essays um, as a graduate student. So it's awesome for me to now have the opportunity to interview on this topic. Um, I want to begin with your perspective on President Biden's comment. Obviously, the transcript is publicly available. It was a domestic fundraiser, so it wasn't, at least to me, not a huge sort of policy statement in that regard. But obviously, Pakistan is very sensitive to remarks like these. What did you make of it? I know you also put out some tweets about, about this as well, but give us a perspective about how you see these comments coming from President Biden and whether they mean a lot or don't mean a lot. What's your point of view? You know, Biden, I think, before he became president, right, had this reputation of certain certainly generating these gaffes, saying things in public that maybe he oughtn't to. And I think one way to read what happened is this is a guy who's been around national and international politics for five decades. And over that time, he's, you know, developed some views. Sometimes those views are quick to change. Sometimes they're not. Um but these views about Pakistan, all the indicators that we have are they've been in Biden's head for a bit. And, you know, Biden, when he was even vice president elect, uh, went to Afghanistan. And Hamid Karzai told, uh, says that Biden told him, uh, President Karzai of Afghanistan, that, he, that Biden thought that Pakistan was 50 times as important as Afghanistan was to U.S. security. Now, Pakistan's bigger than Afghanistan, and Pakistan is an important state, but why would Pakistan be 50 times more important than Afghanistan? And it's got to be nuclear weapons. Uh, the um, In the administration that Biden was vice president in, the Obama administration, uh, Obama repeatedly said he was really worried about terrorists getting nuclear weapons. And when the actor George Clooney was assigned by Esquire magazine to go write a little puff piece on Obama, he asked Obama, what did you what is he what does he worry about in the middle of the night? And Obama said, Pakistan, he worries about in the middle of the night. And so I think, you know, Biden's had these views for a while. These views are not atypical in the U.S. government um, because Pakistan does have more instability than most other nuclear states. And when we're talking about the potential other nuclear states that have problems, it's a short list that includes Pakistan, North Korea, and today Russia. And those are all big problems. They're all at the top of the list of national security makers, decision makers, and, and Pakistan is on that list, sadly. And I think in the context of those comments, like, you know, if you read, start with two or three paragraphs before Pakistan comes up, the president is actually talking about how the Chinese are going to deal with this, right? So in a way, he's also saying, not just about the fact that the U.S. has to deal with it, but a Xi who's getting into his third term has absolute power all of a sudden has to make big decisions about his country's relationship with Russia, 
um, on Taiwan and in that vein, he he mentioned Pakistan. But Chris, we've seen this sort of, you know, concern as you express, even in the Obama administration. Of course, at that time, you know, SWAT was under siege. Large parts of Pakistan's Western periphery were sort of under the control of terrorist groups uh, in, in led by the tariq e in Pakistan. And I remember this time period as, as a Pakistani student at the time studying in the United States that you would wake up and every other day there would be the headline would be some bomb blast in Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, some other major city, right? Peshawar, Quetta, et cetera. Things obviously have improved um, uh, in, in, in the year since. Um, so is there, have you seen or come across any things in the recent past that sort of suggest to you that this concern around nuclear weapons and their security in Pakistan is once again uh, something that, that is emerging in, in Washington in terms of a point of concern? Or do you think that this is just the president's old sort of perspective on, you know, as you said, five year, five decades in, in the mix in international politics? You know, there is an enormous international success story uh, that Pakistan was able to get violence within the state down to like more tolerable levels. It's still high. It's still kind of unacceptable. But, it, you know, compared to 2009, 2010, 2011, this is a huge accomplishment that the Pakistan military and the intelligence uh, apparatus were able to achieve to get from what was a, a low grade civil war down to something that uh, can I think the state can probably manage for a while. But the concern is, obviously, after uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, that the TTP has these ide ideological collect connections to the Afghan Taliban. And, you know, all evidence is, you know, including airstrikes from the Pakistani side, that there's some sort of safe haven being provided to them. Um, either the Afghan Taliban are unwilling or unable to fully um, shut them down, and that that will then kind of recreate the situation that existed in the in the late 2000s, early 2010s that had that that led to that earlier bout of violence, right? So, so that's one problem that 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 even though you can push these things down, if there's a safe haven, they can recur. And then the other problem is that I you know really since 1988. Pakistan has been a political mess, right? So maybe a few years during the Musharraf years are pretty calm. But let's say after Musharraf leaves, just, you know, there's not been a string of more than maybe two years, maybe the beginning of the, this, this most recent PTI government, where you could say that Pakistan wasn't suffering from at least a mid-level political crisis. Now, you know, that happens. Israeli politics has a lot of turnover at the leadership level. But we don't love nuclear states that have a combination of constitutional crises as well as background insurgencies. Like, that's not a great condition. And, you know, look at just like the social media this week about talking, okay, what if the establishment decides to arrest Imran Khan? Now, I don't think that's likely, but it's not in a 0% chance. And people are like, well, maybe the PTI will go break him out of jail, Right. So that's not a that's not the level of social stability that other nuclear states like the United States want to see when they look over, over uh, abroad. Now that is not you know this problem is not unique to Pakistan. For God's sakes, the United States had this January sixth incident last year. So I don't want to um, paper over that. But if you're a U.S. policymaker and somebody tells you, well, you know, what's Pakistani politics like? It's a mess, and it's and, and what's it going to be like next year? It'll probably be a mess too. Um, and there's a big civil military clash. And the military is probably, it's not at all clear that the military is not sympathetic to the PTI, which might be the organization you have to clash with. And you don't like those sorts of big social cleavages uh, going on and with no real end in sight, I should know. So in a way, I, I was reading one of your papers um, where years ago you said that Pakistan's quote, nuclear risk is a byproduct of Pakistan's instability and quote. Um, what I hear from you is that years ago you wrote this, but this still remains to be true. And from a, you know, if I were to read President Biden's use of the word cohesion in the context of what you described, that refers to political cohesion, civil mill cohesion, cohesion around elite rulers who sort of have a path forward to guide this country out of this crisis um, versus no cohesion in terms of, you know, 
lack of security of the nuclear weapons and the processes that that are there in terms of securing these weapons. Obviously, it's a very sophisticated apparatus and a lot of money and investment has been made to strengthen it. So would it be fair then for me to say that basically your point of view is that this is more, the risks are more politically driven versus risks in terms of structure, security, or investments in quote, like, you know, the core nuclear security elements that are involved here? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the statements that Shabazz Sharif, Nawaz Sharif put out, they basically were said, don't impugn our ability to keep these things safe. I think that's, you know, I, nothing I say should be taken as impugning the, you know, the effort by the Pakistani state to keep these assets safe. All indications are this is the some of the most important things um, that the Pakistani state is is safe, you know, charged with safeguarding. But, you know, these systems can are designed to operate during periods of, of normalcy. And the more stresses you put on them, uh, you know, just doesn't make you feel good about it. Right. Um, and so it's those background conditions. It's not, you know, there there was a period maybe in the 90s when Pakistan hadn't stood up its national command authority, hadn't stood up strategic plans division and wasn't focused on the insider threat. And, and during that period of time, then there really were problems. You know, whether you, let's take the AQ Khan case, right? There are two ways to read the AQ Khan case. Either he was a traitor in selling Pakistani nuclear secrets, which is, I should note, still the official story of the Pakistani state, or the Pakistani state let him trade those secrets, which is an allegation other people make. Neither of those make you feel good about what was happening with the Pakistani nuclear weapons program in the 1990s or early 2000s. Now, that is all more or less from what we can tell shut down, certainly by 2004, when he has to apologize in, in national public. And the SPD is granted, you know, a lot of responsibility, a lot of a lot of resources to to both investigate internally, make sure the thousands of Pakistanis that know about nuclear secrets have access to fissile material, have access to sensitive technology to make sure those people are are safe and, and are reliable. And then also you know, maybe 10,000 or so security personnel focused on defending the sites so that if an outsider does learn, is able to penetrate the secrecy of the nuclear program, that even if they attempt to seize nuclear weapons, that they can be defeated. So that's a serious effort on par, I think, with every other nuclear power from what we can tell. And according to press reporting, has been uh, the recipient of international assistance to some degree. So, so I think that's a real dedicated professional um, initiative that Pakistan's undertaken for two decades. But the concern is this background condition of, of political, uh, you know, oscillating between paralysis and crisis and occasionally conflict, um, as well as a variable level of terrorism that thankfully is much lower now than it was a decade ago. But you could tell me a story that a decade from now, we could go back to the same situation. That doesn't seem impossible to me. Yeah, what I think of is, you know, the quote from Stanley Wolpert's biography of Zulfi Bhutto, where Ayub is sort of blowing a gasket about how MI could not sort of have intelligence on Indian tank movements during the 65 war. And the MI chief is, you know, on the record telling his boss, Ayub Khan, mm -hmm. that, well, we couldn't do that because you had told us to put resources of the MI towards political monitoring. Um, so we were under resource constraints and because your orders were focused on domestic politics, I put my best men there and then they didn't, we didn't have enough capabilities to monitor Indian tank movements during a war. Um, now, of course, SPD has its own intel apparatus, its own security forces. So one could argue that even in this heightened sense of political tensions, drama, intrigue, intrigue in Rahul Pindi, Islamabad, um, that, you know, that apparatus doesn't get involved in this type of stuff. But yes, I I personally have the same fears that the more stresses you put on the system, the more people sort of begin ignoring what their core responsibilities are because there's just so much going on and you have a serious problem uh, on your hand as a result of that. One interesting thing uh, you mentioned that I want to provide and have you provide a bit of a perspective on or, or some history lesson here, because I know you mentioned there were two scenarios with AQ Khan, right? That either he was a traitor um, and was sort of involved in this smuggling or this racket or whatever that was, um, or people at a higher level were involved and this was basically a cover-up and he was made to sort of fall on his own sword. Um, 
I agree with you, but the more, you know, when I have these conversations with my Pakistani friends and others who listen, even just during this weekend, people I was WhatsApping, um, they actually don't view AQ Khan as a traitor. Um, they actually view him as a patriotic citizen who contributed immensely to Pakistan's nuclear weapons program. Help the listener who may not have that perspective you and I do about what AQ Khan was up to and what was all of this about, because a lot of Pakistanis to this day believe that this was basically an outside conspiracy, again, to undermine Pakistan's nuclear program and make a case for taking our nukes away. Yeah, so uh, so we have this guy, A.Q. Khan, who's in Europe in the 1970s. And uh, he realizes, both after the, the fall of Dhaka in 1971, but especially after the, the Indians conduct what the Indians called a peaceful nuclear experiment, but nobody else in the world thought it was peaceful, but the Indians branded it that way for a variety of legal reasons. Uh, he offers his services back to Zofi Carbuto. And he says, hey, I know some things. I'm working on centrifuges for European firms, and I think I can help you. And it, and it turned out, you know, they did have uh, a good timing because because the Indians had used uh, nuclear technology they had acquired from Canada and the U.S. that ostensibly they were supposed to use only for peaceful purposes, hence the branding of their explosion. Uh, everybody said, well, we're not going to give anybody this technology again because we, it's not safe. So we'll have to have much more ex expansive safeguard arrangements in the future. And Pakistan was at that time negotiating to get um, plutonium production reactor technology from overseas. So Pakistan was kind of thrown for a loop. They had been exploring uranium en enrichment technologies, which is what AQ Khan worked on, centrifuges. And so they said, yeah, sure, come, we'll, we'll take you. And Khan was a very successful bureaucratic entrepreneur, managed to kind of push out a lot of other talent from the, the rival parts of what was then called the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission. And then Khan eventually created his own research laboratories. Uh, and he set to work. And there's a bit of a debate in the engineering and scientific literature, I should note, about whether Khan happened to just by accident have access to a particularly bad centrifuge design. So he may have there there's a there is a there's a case to be made that Khan's centrifuge design was was less uh well adapted to the Pakistani context than the one that they had been working on prior to him coming home. So it's it's certainly some people could say that he slowed the program down. That's unclear to me. I can't adjudicate that technical discussion, but it, that argument can be made. W whatever, the, uh, people perceived that he was helping the centrifuge program, and he was a good bureaucrat. He was creating a big little empire. But uh, as he was producing the first enriched uranium, uh, he also, in the late 1980s, started selling this stuff. And he seems to have reached out to... Um, Iran maybe first, uh, but soon also reached out to North Korea. Um, he reached out to Iraq, and we have some evidence that Saddam Hussein actually thought it was a U.S. trap. Um, he said, "Why are these? Why is this U.S. ally of Pakistan approaching me uh, for nuclear weapons technology? It must be some sort of trick." Uh, and then um, ultimately with Libya. So with each of was these, there, just on, ahead. on this note, um, I remember reading something about his trail leading to Syria as well, and the Israelis sort of picking up on it and then realizing that the Syrians were up to something as well. Is that just a rumor? Because again, I haven't looked deep enough into this, but I do remember reading a couple of essays and articles about how Syria was also part of this. Yeah, so Khan, definitely there was a concern about Syria as another client. There is a concern about, um, which we can get to, this is pretty important, about whether India was a client of the AQ Khan network. Um, and then Khan also traveled to Saudi Arabia, we know. And it's like, you know, was he just there to have some nice dinners? It's unclear. Uh, so the again, we have these two stories about whether he's a traitor or whether he's helping the state. So Iran is maybe the clearest argument in favor that he might have been a state actor. You had an army chief at the time, Mirza Aslam Beg, who had this idea of strategic defiance that Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, maybe with Iraq, they should all work together to defy the West. And, and Mirza Aslam Beg seems like the sort of guy that might authorize some help with the Iranian nuclear program. We don't know, but it like, seems plausible uh, that that might happen. And the timeline kind of works out, 87, 88, so right when Mirza Aslam Beg is becoming more important as a person. 
With North Korea, the argument that people make that it was the state is that North Korea did provide liquid fueled rocket technology, ballistic missile technology to Pakistan. Um, and those then were tested and were part of the, the nuclear deterrent. Um, the counter argument is that Pakistan did not really need them and had a had a more successful solid fuel, which is better for a variety of reasons, missile program that the that Khan's bureaucratic rivals were working on. And so Khan really was trying to get the missiles for his own bureaucratic rivalry, his own status concerns. And Pakistan would probably have gotten the solid fuel missiles anyway. Uh, we don't know, but there's evidence in favor that maybe Benazir Bhutto knew about it. She, she in fact, has said that she authorized a cash payment for the missiles. So she don't she doesn't know why Khan would have needed to provide the centrifuge technology. But the, the record there is a little vague. And then the Libya, the Libyans said they gave Pakistan a couple hundred million dollars, which seems like a bad deal. And from my read, if you look at what other countries pay for this sort of stuff, a couple hundred million dollars seems kind of like chump change to me. Um, uh, but those are the, the cases. So maybe, you know, helped Libya out for some money that maybe that was good for Pakistan during a period of a currency crunch in the, in the 1990s helped North Korea out for some missile technology um, and helped Iran out for a variety of strategic reasons would be the argument in terms of the state. Now, like I said, there is an argument that India ultimately did acquire centrifuge technology via the network. I can't adjudicate that. The, the evidence on that is shakier than the other, the other cases because there wasn't an IAEA investigation or anything in that regard. Um, and then, you know, the Musharraf government made Khan say they was doing it in private, and they 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 were pretty fulsome to international investigators about that. But you know, it's it, it's hard to disprove the possibility that he was acting on the state behalf. As an outside analyst, I have to you know hold both possibilities in my head. I personally think he was probably doing more nuclear moonlighting than he was uh, acting on the state's behest. But I, I I think the evidence is is not clear. But neither scenario makes me feel good about what was going on in the 90s or the early 2000s. That's like that's a really bad outcome and really dangerous outcome. And really, really only, um, you know, North Korea, maybe in the last two decades, has taken such risks with such sensitive technology. And so in the aftermath of, of this entire thing, and again, thank you for that perspective. And I'm sure a lot of listeners would find it insightful because most people don't have that clarity of view in terms of what A.Q. Han was doing. But when all of this happened, when Musharraf made him go on television and sort of read out his confession statement, et cetera, obviously there was a lot of international scrutiny on Pakistan, right? And the Pakistanis also still do say that, you know, after that they beefed up security, beefed up intel, tightened the processes, et cetera. Um, and that, again, in, in the loose conversations I have, the, the point is, look, if the state was involved, the state would not be so committed and sort of strengthening all the gaps that perhaps led to this by moonlighting. Um, what sort of actions did you see in the aftermath of this? Um, that sort of maybe, I don't know if it did give you comfort or not, but please share with us your assessment of how Pakistan reacted to it and built up, you know, better, more secure capabilities around nukes so that there could be no AQ Khan in the future. Yeah. So, you know, you had mentioned earlier this story about Ayub and Zulfi and the MI was focused more on domestic political opponents. Something similar was occurring in the 80s with the ISI, uh, where their dominant concern was to try to keep outside moles from penetrating the program because they were worried that the United States or the Israelis or other Western powers, the Indians, would be able to figure out how far the program was going along and then put really strong nonproliferation pressures on the Pakistan state. So they were focused so much outside that they didn't necessarily deal with these insider concerns. And, you know, there's really three things that are happening, three streams that kind of converge to lead to this intense Western concern about Pakistan in the early 2000s, right? So one is in the aftermath of 9-11, there is a real, a rapid increase in the, in the, the danger to the Pakistani state as they, you know, these Islamist zealots decide that the Pakistani state is not on their side anymore. And very serious, very credible assassination attempts against Pervez Musharraf rattled the U.S. system and obviously rattled the Pakistani system, too. too. I mean, I heard Pervez Musharraf tell tell people about, uh, you know, in my presence about how close the assassination attempts got to killing him. And he struck me as a man that really did feel like he almost died. So that and, and... doesn't have a way of focusing the mind 
um, uh, about the about the threat from from domestic terrorism. And I think Adrian Levy, um, he was on an Atlantic Council webinar, and he's written a book on this, and um, said that the assassination attempts the public knows were a fraction of the total number. I think mm. I may be remem misremembering, but I think he said there were close to a dozen or so assassination yeah. attempts on Musharraf. Um, obviously, the majority of them were nipped in the bud. But again, that that goes to show how serious the threat was that we only remember the bombings and stuff, but there was a lot more going on in the background. Yeah, absolutely. So we have this this one stream about threats to the senior leadership of the state, which were quite serious. Then we have, at meanwhile, the AQ Khan stuff is going on. I should note, I should observe that we. it seems as if the CIA managed to penetrate the network at some point quite thoroughly. Um, and that was that helped permit rolling it up once the Libyans kind of talked about it, right? There's always a challenge for an intelligence collector. Do I watch this bad thing happening or do I try to touch it? But if I touch it, the whole intelligence operation might come unraveled. Sorry um, to interrupt so again on this. When did the Libyans start talking? Was this when they had their sort of the ice was broken with the United States again and Gaddafi had said, I don't want nuclear weapons or was there... Yeah, so the required. Libyans more or less turned the Pakistanis in at some level, right? They, they so so after the Iraq War in March of two thousand three, shortly in a few weeks later, you know, after Baghdad had fallen, there were the neocons were quite chesty, you know, before Iraq obviously turned bad, and so they they talked about the beyond the axis of evil, where they named um, Cuba, Libya, and Syria. I think were the next three, and there had there had been a long talk about also after taking Baghdad, you take a left turn, you take a right turn, right? Did regime change that was everybody was doing it. So, but it did, did appear to to shake Gaddafi, and so in two thousand four, I believe it's been a while since I looked at this history. Uh, he came. He, he had done a, a set of secret talks with the British and U.S. intelligence agencies about coming in from the cold. And one of the deals was that he would completely dismantle his weapons of mass destruction program. And part of that was they told the U.S. and the U.K. everything that they had gotten from the AQCon network. Um, in fact, so much so that even after that, um, you know, the, the U.S. intercepted a shipment heading toward Libya on this ship, the BBC China and we missed one of the containers and and when it got to libya they said oh you missed a box here come pick it up right they 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 really wanted to make they didn't want to get caught in the future because they were trying to turn a page and didn't turn out well for Gaddafi before it was also that, done that's a that's a really good informant right there yeah um so so we have this set of things going with AQCon that were quite I, that the us senior leadership were quite aware by early 2000 and the last room i should mention is we have um, these other Pakistani scientists, uh, Majid and Mahmood, uh, who found this foundation after they retire, uh, both are involved in the nuclear, the, 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 not the KRL, not the Khan Research Laboratory side, but the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission side. And something happens where they wind up at a campfire in Afghanistan talking to Osama bin Laden in August of 2001. Um, and bin Laden was quite interested about nuclear technology, having these nuclear scientists in front of him. And those interests were not about creating a, a nuclear power sector for Afghanistan. So all three of those streams are converging on U.S. policymakers in the mid 2000s, and they're freaked out. And so Pakistan does react uh, by it had already started creating the strategic plans division, which was very nascent by the late 1990s. But then by 99 or so, they start standing it up in a real way. And then in reaction, at least publicly, they at least talk about it in reaction to these early 2000s threats. And they start publicizing what's going on in the security side. They say that they're going to have a security division, uh, which has 10,000 dedicated personnel to, to protecting nuclear sites. Uh, they talk a lot more about how um, the weapons are safeguarded, whether there's permissive action links, these sort of electronic locks that make the weapons uh, harder to use in the absence of a code. Um, and then they talk about, you know, a little bit about, not very much, but a little bit about personnel reliability programs, which are the systems that most nuclear weapon states have to make sure that people that have access to nuclear weapons will be screened additionally for their reliability um, and that they won't be the sort of people that will go have campfire talks with Osama bin Laden down the road. And they spend a lot of effort, I think, the, the evidence suggests they spend a lot of effort surveilling these people in their personal life to keep track of their habits uh, to make sure they don't turn, they don't break bad. 
uh, for lack of a, a, a you know, to use a cliche. And, um, you know, I think all evidence is the SPD uh, does that job pretty well. It'd be hard to know if they do it poorly, you know, so I think we should be clear um, that the absence of evidence only tells us so much. Um, there, in the early 2010s and late 2000s, there were a series of attacks against facilities that could have nuclear weapons in them, could not. You know, one great thing about secrecy is, is you know, for both outsiders and presumably for 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 bad guys as well, they don't know where these things are. Um, but you know, when when terrorists manage to to breach uh, naval bases outside Karachi or general headquarters, front lines, or or the Wa ordnance complexes, um, those are those are things that that make you worried. And those sorts of attacks haven't happened in a while, right? So a decade is a long time. Probably, you know, the last major attack. There was an attempted hijacking of a Pakistani frigate, the PNS Sulfikar, in 2014. So, you know, that's not so long in the past, but eight years is, is non-trivial as well. So so the thing, I think as the, all evidence is the SPD focused more, Pakistan focused in a very clear way on dealing with the insurgency and terrorist threat that, that really did metastasize by the end of the 2000s. Um, and and today is better um, with the with the big difference that the political crisis hasn't disappeared. Um, and, and in fact, the the civil military showdown now is is as bad as it's been since the 70s, maybe. I mean, I would really have to think and you don't want to compare to the 80s and 90s, but it's 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 certainly it's it's in a league since I've been watching Pakistan closely, which is around 2002. Yeah, I've been saying that this is. You know, I was born in 1988, so I wasn't even alive when 71 happened. But from history books and from my own sort of short reading of Pakistani history, to me, um, what's going on right now is perhaps the most serious crisis to cohesion since 71. Because you have politicians at each other's throats, no rules of the game, an establishment that is discredited and is no longer seen to be, uh, you know, in its own weird way, a guarantor of truce or peace in, in the political system that's no longer there. Um, and we don't know where things go with Khan calling for a for a long march. Um, focusing on the politics side as well, because, you know, we agree that the, the, the concern comes from the political sort of unraveling of the state itself, and which is where what the risk is, there's an economic crisis on top of it as well. Um, when you look at and observe some of the comments coming out of Pakistan. I was recently there uh, in September as well. And I want to get your perspective on two things. Let's start with this first one, which is that when I um, talk to folks in, in September um, in Islamabad and elsewhere, um, there was this concern expressed by some, and Khan himself has talked about this a little bit of time, uh, Shabazz Gil's whole mutiny conversation was related to this uh, fear in the military as well, that what the narrative is, is about creating a split um, in the military rank and file itself, right? And and this idea of a colonel's coup, which has happened in different parts of the world, there have been attempts made, they've all failed in Pakistan in the past of having a colonel's coup, that somehow you may have this sort of split within the rank and file of the military where all of a sudden the nuclear sort of security safety is there's a big question mark about this because the institution is at war with itself. Um, have you been having growing concerns around that element as well? Because I've heard it in bits and pieces from folks that that being a political strategy. And I was just curious to get your perspective on that, given how it impacts potential concerns around nuclear security. Well, this is, you know, we're in a unique situation. Everybody's trying to figure out what will General Bajwa do, right? This is a downside with the army chief being the most critical node in Pakistani politics is people have to look at him for all sorts of things. Well, well what is General Bajwa going to do on flood relief? What is he going to do in negotiating with the IMF? How is he going to negotiate additional liquefied natural gas from the Qataris, right? It's like, so the, the, you know, the plus of the army chief is you have a lot of power in that position, but, but he's doing things that really no single person should be able to do. Um, so what is so there's it's you have to kind of break this question down will there be a confrontation between now and november when when bajwa needs to figure out whether he's going to be renewed and, and have an ec, another extraordinary extension or not you know i i think we can probably muddle through the next few weeks uh without a big clash 
Will Bajwa, as he has indicated he will, step down. I guess I would put money on that, but I don't think I would bet my house on it. Um, so so if he if he does step down, then I think there's a, a pretty clear path, which is you have some sort of compromise. You know, there's a variety of boring three-star generals in the Pakistan army that don't people that are not politically salient at the moment. Um, one of them comes in, nudges toward early elections. The PMLN does poorly, probably not as badly as people are saying, but they'll, you know, there's a big, and the PTI comes back with a majority. And then there'll have to be a new civil military um, modus vivendi created. And that, if that occurs, that is more or less the story of Pakistani politics since 1988 with the Musharraf interregnum. Um, if for whatever reason, uh, a deal cannot be found between the PTI and the army, um, then then you're in territory that hasn't been seen for a while. Uh, and in the 70s, when there was when there was difficulty, when Budo was really in a fight with his with the civilian political opponents and tried to bring the army into it, the army just said, OK, we're going to we're going to arrest you and hang you instead. Um, and that is probably a harder solution to pull off for a variety of reasons, in part because uh, right now, at least, the PTI is so popular. Now, I should know the Pakistani. I mean, you follow the Pakistani economic situation better than me, but I I believe that any governing party under these economic circumstances is gonna be unpopular. Khan's great. I mean, it really is great luck was that the the no confidence vote happened when he did. I mean, he couldn't have lucked out any better if he had. I, I think if he was in dealing with these same set of circumstances, uh, the PTI's luster would be would be entirely gone at the moment. Um, so, so if the PTI does manage to get in, uh, I, I don't see any reason why, uh, why they will create a durable, you know, multi-year majority. The Pakistan, all of Pakistan's economic challenges, um, will remain for whoever governs in 2023. Uh, so I think, you know, my bigger concern is not some sort of immediate clash. I can't rule that out. And I think a, a prudent policymaker has to worry about it, um, but that instead we continue this spiral where Pakistan is growing at one percent, two percent a year, um, and 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 its people are understandably dissatisfied with that state of affairs, um, and, and that that may be occurring in the background of great, greater um, disaster risk because of climate change. That's that I think is unclear right now, but it's certainly a realistic possibility. So it's just uh, a society that's getting hammered and it's not getting its health back up in between, I think is the concern. Um, and I don't see any evidence, even if the PTI comes back in, I see no evidence that they're able to turn the economy around in a way that would put Pakistan on a path to being like a, you know, a solid middle income power. So this is something that I was talking to uh, with Khura Hussain last week on the podcast as well. And I've had this conversation with a lot of folks publicly, privately, off record as well, that, you know, I follow the political economy and I fully agree with what you said. This crisis isn't going away. It's going to get worse. And so anybody who has power is going to see and experience a ridiculously fast decline in their political capital for no fault of their own. That's it's just, that's just, you know, one could say, okay, it's all your fault because you've been in part and parcel ruling over the country and a sustained secular decline. But, you know, in the immediate term, it is what it is. Um, in that scenario, when I push people, well, it's hard for you to get the foreign financing you need. The dollar is expensive. The Fed is raise, raising rates. The Chinese aren't that interested anymore either because you need to get your act together, et cetera, et cetera. All the stuff you and I have heard before. When I, when I push them, at least, I hear this, you know, final sort of defense, which is, it's not even a defense, a final statement of fact, basically, that we're too big to fail. The world has to intervene and stabilize the economy because it's 230 million people, median age under 25, uh, lots of joblessness. And if you add a default-like scenario or Sri Lanka-like scenario in a country like Pakistan, oh, by the way, we have nuclear weapons too, right? And that in 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 the the heart of hearts of a Pakistani elite, that ultimately is the last hope that they have. Is the world will say the mess that's going to happen here if you if the chaos you know goes into a direction we don't want, like a Sri Lanka, um, then the mess is going to be even more costly to deal with. And so give them a few billion. Do you see that the U.S. and other Western policymakers still buying that argument that says? 
hey, bail out Pakistan with another few billion right now because we don't want chaos and then nukes in the wrong hands? Or are yeah. they fatigued by this? You know, I don't know if you you know have a friend or a family member that's been in some financial distress and then sometimes you'll give them some money and they're able to get by, they're able not to get evicted from their house or something. But that's a different story than thriving, right? So it is it is possible. I, I personally do believe most U.S. governments and most U.S. government officials are going to work to make sure Pakistan keeps its head above water. Um, you know, that's that was the publicly stated rationale that Assistant Secretary of Defense Eli Ratner gave for why the U.S. continued to to have a defense relationship that involved F-16 updates. Um you know, that would cost several hundred million dollars. He said, we have an important defense relationship with Pakistan that's premised on counterterrorism and it's premised on nuclear security, right? Those were the only two principal ideas that he mentioned in public. And he said that just, you know, less than a month ago. And Joe Biden seems to indicate that, you know, those concerns are not just located in the Pentagon. Uh, the great late uh, political scientist Stephen Cohen in his 2004 book on Pakistan, the idea of Pakistan, I think has a line that said, you know, Pakistan, like North Korea, is too nuclear to fail. And I, I, you know, I believe that is is basically true with the important proviso that Pakistan is not the only place in the world that have weird politics right now. We are going through a period of exceptionally odd politics. And we already saw once that uh, a U.S. president, Donald Trump, decided he was fine to rupture the relationship because he was so annoyed with what he perceived as Pakistani double crossing. Um, it is possible Trump will come back. Trump has a weird personal uh, connection with Imran Khan. So that's like a weird idiosyncratic confounder. Uh, but well, there's there are, also a huge overlap between mega donors to Donald Trump and to Imran Khan. Like anybody can go on Google and find the Pakistani American diaspora and among them, the most wealthy giving, giving money to both of these in, individuals. Yeah. So there's, uh, there is, so there are interesting dynamics there, but it is, you know, could, can a Pakistani decision maker depend um, on on sanity in D.C. and Beijing? Um, and that's kind of really what we're talking about now. The what European powers, I don't are, are in a bit of a mess themselves right now. So can they depend on that five, 10 years from now? I don't know. U.S. politics could go into a weird spiral itself um, where it looks inward and is willing to take more risks overseas than it has in the past. Uh, but I do think there is something to the logic. When I look at South Asia, I believe there are really only two vital U.S. national security interests. I'm a bit of an outlier in this, but I think one is to prevent any nuclear weapons from falling in the hands of violent non-state actors. And two is to prevent an India-Pakistan nuclear exchange. Those are the only things that I worry about that might kill thousands of Americans. I, you know, I'm worried I want India to help with China. I want Pakistan to help with other things, too. But those are the vital national interests. There's a lot of important national interest in other domains. Um, and and I do think the U.S. will, at the end of the day, will, will probably you know, grind its teeth at the IMF and the World Bank and, and do what it needs to to keep Pakistan moving on. After all, there, you know, as Adam Smith said a few centuries ago, there's a lot of ruin in a nation, right? It's actually fa state failure is really hard to pull off. Um, it's pretty rare um, in the international system. But you can kind of be stagnant for decades and, and, and the U.S. could maybe make sure that occurs. But it doesn't mean it's a, a, a end state that is desirable uh, for Pakistan. And even for the, the, you know, the Pakistani establishment, which is concerned about competing in South Asia, that's a really bad outcome because if India is growing at higher rates than Pakistan, eventually this competition will become unmanageable. Well, on state failure, right, you can we can use the tighter, more technical way of analyzing what is and isn't state failure. But to me, um, when I look at the fact that, you know, in the early 90s or late 80s, you know, you compare Pakistan's human development indicators with parts of sub-Saharan Africa, Pakistan was leaps and bounds ahead of them. Uh, and today, Pakistan's youth literacy is below that of Rwanda, a country that went through a much more brutal civil war and a uh, an instance of state failure, we would say, right? It's front and center, Rwanda went through that. Um, and yet it has managed to turn around at least on key socioeconomic indicators, especially those that suggest a long-term takeoff, right? If you have 90 plus percent youth literacy, odds are holding everything else constant, you maintain some level of stability or society is going to progress just because you've sort of built, put in place the building blocks of literacy and uneducated women, workforce participation, et cetera, and Pakistan struggling in all of that. 
Um, last question on on this topic before I get you uh, to recommend some books. Um, do you see any huge impact of this statement from the weekend or October 14th, et cetera, on the relationship? Or do you see this just being another part of a 48 hour long Twitter dominated news cycle that, you know, we're recording this Monday, October 17th. By the time this podcast comes out Friday morning, Eastern time, people would have forgotten about what even happened uh, the weekend before this podcast came out. Yeah. So this is, you know, one plus a silver lining of having very atypical uh, these politics of perpetual crisis as new storms blow in and distract you from the storm of yesterday. And I, I don't this will go in the quote bank that people trot out periodically to talk about how the U.S. has unreliable views on Pakistan. But, you know, by in, in my social media feed, at least by the time of the by-election results over the weekend, this had basically got blown away by the next thing. Um, I think this is like the shackles of slavery comment Imran Khan made. Every every op-ed on Pakistan-U.S. nuclear cooperation will begin with a Joe Biden quote now. That's right. And he's given, you know, this is not the only one he's given over the years either. So, um, but the, there is a concern that U.S. policymakers have about about Pakistani stability. To some extent, that redounds to Pakistan's benefit for the reasons that we talked about. Um, but it also is annoying, right, to have another state. And, you know, if you're Pakistani, you look and you're like, do you think you're better than me? Like, like you're messed up, America. You did all this bad stuff. You had an insurrection that where people stormed the Capitol building. Who are you to judge me? And you, you didn't say anything when a, when a missile from across the border landed in my backyard. That shouldn't have happened. And you don't have anything much to say about that. Yeah, they. I think, they're, you know, Pakistan did handle itself well during this cruise missile launch that India um, was responsible for last year. And, you know, should be commended for that. And India should be criticized for having procedures in place that that permitted such an accidental launch. So so I, my background point I always make on this is that nuclear weapons are incredibly dangerous and every nuclear weapon state has serious and continuing problems. And the more nuclear weapons you have, the more problems you're probably going to have. The U.S. all the time, we have weird prostitution rings and drug scandals and all sorts of bad stuff happens in people that have access to the U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile. But one thing that the U.S. system does is it typically ventilates those problems and we learn about it. In the Pakistani system, for understandable reasons, if there were problems like that, they would probably stay secret unless things got very, very bad. So... Uh, Everyone has to try all the time. And the U.S. did incredibly dangerous things in the Cold War. And my hope, my fervent hope, is that new nuclear powers will not make the same mistakes that the U.S. and the Soviet Union did when we almost blew up the world, right? So so it is, um, it, it, it requires kind of constant vigilance. And, and you know what? You only have to mess up one time. Uh, and nobody's going to be like, well, you did really well for 20 years. Like that's not going to cut any slack for anybody. Uh, so that is that is the responsibility that comes with being a nuclear weapon state is people will be looking over your shoulder indefinitely. And that will always be the case in a, in a place like Pakistan that has violent non-state actors that are operating around to have these weird ties with the state um, and in a period of, of political crisis as well. Dr. Gary, this has been awesome. Thank you for your insights and for giving us the background, especially on AQ Khan. I think it's, again, uh, one of those things that even today, oddly speaking, you know, if I were to go on Twitter and write some of the things you wrote about what he did, I'm pretty certain I will get a lot of flack. And if I tagged you, you will by extension get some flack as well. Um, because apparently he's still considered a patriot by many in, in Pakistan. And for whatever reason, you know, the truth about what he did as an individual selling state secrets um, and sort of, you know, if you buy the official story for money, um, that's a heinous crime. And yes, he's passed away. I, he has passed away, right? Yes, he has. Um, and all of that. But, you know, there are things that the people of the country should have been told honestly, and they weren't. So thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, before I let you go, 
Um, what are two or three books you would recommend to our audience? And again, they can be on nuclear safety and security, given that's the topic we just talked about, but they don't have to be. So anything interesting you would want to recommend, please do so. Yeah, let me give you uh, all, you know, three books on nuclear matters. Uh, the first is by, uh, you know, a retired brigadier, Feroz Khan, uh, called Eating Grass, which was his sort of history of the Pakistani nuclear program, I think, really set the standard. And then more recently, uh, Mansoor Ahmed uh, wrote a book called Pakistan's Pathways to the Bomb. Uh, both of those are available widely in the U.S. I think Eating Grass is pretty available widely in Pakistan as well. Maybe uh, Mansoor's book is a little more challenging to get there, but both are very good. Um uh, and our, and and look at, you know, a lot of the incredible accomplishments of the Pakistani nuclear program in the face of these economic pressures, of nonproliferation pressures, Pakistan managed to achieve a lot. And there's a lot that Pakistan can be proud of, even if there's also periods where um, bureaucratic fighting, other problems uh, led to, to outcomes that were pathological. And that happens in every nuclear weapon states. Uh, and on that note, a book that I recommend uh, is is a classic by uh, political scientist Scott Sagan called Limits of Safety, which looks at why U.S. nuclear weapons organizations made a series of, of dangerous decisions and were involved in lots of accidents during the Cold War. Um, and, and crises that we thought were pretty dangerous at the time, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, may have been you know, considerably more dangerous than we knew at the time. Uh, in the in the weight of evidence that we've accumulated since then, and I think it's a uh, you know it's it's now thirty years old, uh, but it holds up well and indicates why it's almost impossible for a nuclear weapon state to maintain perfect levels of safety all the time. Uh, mistakes are going to happen in these large organizations, and I'll use you know you said three, but I'm gonna I'm gonna use the opportunity to to plug my book, the difficult politics of peace. Uh, out with Oxford University Press, which is a history of the India-Pakistan conflict since 1947. So uh, thank you so much, Uzair, for having me on the No, thank, thanks for those recommendations. And I don't think I've read Limits of Safety, but I've, I'm blanking on the name. That's also a classic about many of the mistakes that happened in the U.S. nuclear program, including I remember reading in, in that book something, some accident in an ICBM facility where the fire systems or something was not working and it almost blew up the damn place um, in the middle. Yeah, there's a very good book called uh, Command and Control. I think Command and, yes, Control. yes, yes. That's an ex, that, I remember reading that one and I was like, holy crap, like somehow it's it's uh, it's a miracle that we're still alive. With yeah, I debated whether I should, uh, that, that between the Sagan and the Schlosser book, both are very good. Schlosser is maybe a little bit more readable um, and more recent. Uh, and it does center on this episode where uh, uh, a U.S. ICBM blew up, um, and uh, and the warhead and the and the silo kind of blew up in the air and landed again, and luckily didn't detonate. Yeah, we're we're lucky to be alive. Um, but again, thank you so much for taking out the time on short notice. Um, I hope the audience enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. And Dr. Clary, again, keep up the work and the analysis coming. I personally learn a lot and it was an honor and a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you for having me.